Hey, I'm Matthew from EveryAmp. In a few of my Powerwall videos, I showed some little bits of my smart home system and how I have it integrated with the Powerwall. And a few of you left comments asking for more about that. So this is just kind of a tour of my system, some examples of how different things work, and a little bit of why I chose Home Assistant to run my house off of. Before we dive in too deep here, let's start with some basics of what this is and what I'm doing so that we're all on the same page. So what is a smart device? Typically that could be like an outlet or a light switch or a light bulb that has some ability to communicate with other devices. Usually people think of that in terms of like an app on their smartphone that they can use to turn something on and off. So you could have multiple smart devices together in a smart home and those things can interact with each other. So maybe you have Amazon's Alexa or Google's Assistant. You can use voice commands to control things like outlets and light bulbs. But in most cases, those are only gonna happen if you explicitly tell it to happen. The next step from that is home automation where you can build rules and logic to make things happen automatically. So for example, like your smartphone has GPS, that GPS could interact with the system and let it know when you're home and it could automatically turn your lights on for you when you get home, if it's in the dark. In our house, we not only turn on the lights when we get home in the dark, it also sets the temperature of the thermostat and unlocks the door coming from the garage into the house. So one of my absolute favorite things about Home Assistant is the user interface. Not only do they have a fully usable, fully functional app, but it also works on computer screens. So it's really just a web page that you can pull up from any web browser. And I really, really like that. There are a lot of tasks that I may do from my phone that are just kind of a glance. I need to turn something on and off. I want to check the status of something, but then I'll use the computer to check graphs or maybe do more detailed programming of automations. So here's my overview page. That's the first thing that I see when I connect. It's mostly for quick access to frequently used controls and to just check the status of things. From there, I have dedicated pages with more detailed information on topics. My climate page has the basics from the overview page, but then it adds temperature trends and humidity gauges. I have this whole section for my solar powered skylights because I have Home Assistant open and close them based on the inside temperature and the outside temperature, what time of day it is and what the high is that day. That sounds a little complicated and it kind of is, but we don't have air conditioning here. So this is really the main way that we regulate temperature in the house in the summer. I have Home Assistant tell Google Home to make an announcement that, hey, I'm opening or closing the skylights and you should probably open or close the windows so that we can get some air flowing in the house. On the energy page, this data is mostly being pulled from Tesla's gateway that coordinates the power wall with the grid and my solar. And one thing that I like on this page is the energy graph that shows me our overall energy use, but also splits the house out from our 3D printer farm in the garage. So yeah, if you're not a regular to this channel, I have a 3D printer farm. In total, we have 20 Prusa Mark 3S printers that we use to make snap plate front license plate mounts for Teslas. 10 of them are in my garage, 10 of them are in my business partner's garage. But for my house, I also have a dedicated page in Home Assistant just for the printer farm. So here are gauges for the power and the voltage go into each printer. I have switches, I can individually turn them on and off. And then I have a big switch that I can turn them all on with or back off unless they're printing. So I built a little fail safe into it so that if for whatever reason, I try to turn them all off when they're working, it says, duh, you can't do that. And it just leaves them on. Most recently, I've been playing with smart light bulbs. I really like bulbs that can change color temperature so that when they're bright, they're like a daylight white. But when they're dim, they're a warm white that everybody likes in the evenings. So I have them set up that throughout the day, they change brightness and they change color temperature. Next up is the safety page with details on our smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Then the security page has motion sensors, window sensors, locks, 
and details on the Blink cameras that I have inside and outside of the house. The media page shows my Google Assistant devices throughout the house, what they're playing at the time. It shows my Shield TV that's in my media center, also my receiver. I haven't really done a whole lot with media yet, but one thing I have been doing is dimming and brightening my lights depending on whether we are starting or stopping watching something on the TV. And finally, I have a batteries page that just shows me the battery state of different battery powered devices that I have around the house. So what hardware does all of this? You may have seen advertisements for different smart home devices that say no hub required. And that sounds like a good thing. Hubs add complication and extra cost to setups. But the thing that people miss from that is that there's always a hub required. If it's not in your house, it's in somebody else's house or it's in a cloud server, who knows where. And that's not always a good thing. So we'll talk about more on that in a minute though. So Home Assistant runs on some sort of local device in your house. Little Raspberry Pi single board computers are popular. They are kind of the minimum that you need to do it and they have some pros and cons. You can use another computer that you already have that runs all the time and just run Home Assistant in the background. But I choose to use an Intel NUC. That is NUC, stands for Next Unit of Computing. And it's just kind of a laptop that doesn't have a screen or a keyboard or a trackpad in a little box that Intel sells as just a standalone product. I run the Home Assistant OS on it, and it just makes a very simple, reliable way of running Home Assistant, and I like it. Connected to it, I have this little USB dongle that talks Z-Wave and Zigbee, which is like a really low powered version of Wi-Fi that is particularly suited to like battery powered devices. So that's good for things like door and window sensors that just have to run off of little batteries. I also have quite a few Wi-Fi devices around the house that I've made or modified using ESP Home. A lot of the Internet of Things smart home devices that we see around use a chip called an ESP. It's made by a company called Espressive Systems, and this is a version called the Node MCU. It has the ESP chip on it. You can program these chips to do almost anything that you want. So like this outlet used to phone home to China, but I was able to use something called Tuya Convert to make it work with ESP Home. So now it's purely local and all of its data stays in the house and all of its control is done locally in the house. I also used one of those Node MCUs to make this sensor. So this can plug in and sit flat against the wall. It has a motion sensor, and then at the bottom, it has temperature, humidity, and indoor air quality. So those PM 2.5 numbers that you see talked about, especially during wildfire season, this can read that and give me a local indication inside the house. So we've looked at the user interface and also the hardware, but what brings all that together? So in Home Assistant, we call them integrations. So for those battery powered devices that talk Z-Wave and Zigbee, they come in through the Z-Wave and Zigbee integrations. Those ESP devices connect using these. But then I also have some cloud devices like my August locks or my Blink cameras or just weather information. And those come in here. There's another integration for the apps on our smartphones that pull in that GPS data or which Wi-Fi network that we're connected to that we can use to do present sensing. You can also do things like scan NFC tags with your phone and use that to run automations. The best way to find out information about any of these integrations is just to search Google. So if I search Google for Home Assistant Tesla integration, you can see all the different sensors that it brings in, and what those will give you inside of Home Assistant. You can then take any of those sensors and you can use them to automate other things. I don't currently have our cars connected to Home Assistant because I just personally haven't had a need for it. I just try to avoid adding extra complication when it's not bringing me something that I need in return. So how do we automate this kind of stuff? 
Well, that really depends on what you're trying to do and when you're trying to do it. A common thing that most people do is they spend time at home, they spend time away from home, and they sleep. So one way you can accomplish that is using scenes. So I have a home scene, a night scene, and an away scene. And depending on which scene we're in, it turns lights on and off, it changes the state of locks, and it changes the temperature on the thermostat. In between those scenes, I have automations that do things based on the time of the day or the state of something else in the house changing. So we'll use two examples of my lights turning on an hour before sunset and me getting a notification when the power wall is fully charged. For the lights, we go into configuration, automation, and I come down to that automation and we have a trigger. So one hour before sunset, we need to perform this automation. We have a section for conditions, which I have set for only do this if we're at home. And then there's an action called light.turnon where I tell my lights in the living area to turn on. I also set a brightness and a color temperature for them. For a little more complicated example, we'll look at the notification for the power wall. So here we're going to trigger if the power wall battery gets above 99%. Next are conditions, which I don't have any set right now, so this runs anytime it happens. Finally, we have the action, which I'm going to choose the service called notify. Then I choose all devices or which device or which person, and then I have to give it a message to send. You can see this message is in a very special format called a YAML, stands for yet another markup language. It's similar to coding, but it's more of just a standardized configuration language. And things like special characters and spaces really, really matter. So it can be frustrating at times when you have a character in the wrong place or a space in the wrong place. And it can be a little discouraging to people. I point this out because while a lot of Home Assistant is graphical at this point, there are a lot of advanced features that have to be done in YAML. So that configuration, you're probably gonna have to do at some point if you choose to use Home Assistant. But there is hope. There is a new feature called Blueprints that lets you publish and download blueprints of automations from other people. So a lot of that YAML is taken care of for you. There's also an integration called Node-RED that gives you more of a graphical flowchart type way of building automations. It has some additional features that you can't even do with the regular automation engine in Home Assistant, but so far it has been able to meet my needs and I'm not too scared of YAML, so I've just been keeping it simple. But Node-RED is a very popular option if you're interested in that. So that's the tour. Hopefully it was detailed enough to give you a real idea of what Home Assistant is like, but not overly detailed that I've lost too many people. So with all the options out there, why did I choose Home Assistant? So number one is definitely local control. Like I said before, if you don't own your hub, someone else does. It may be in another country, subject to different laws, but you in any case are connected to it through the internet, which means if your internet goes down, it stops working. If that company goes out of business or they get purchased by someone else, the service could go away, they could change the pricing on you. So really it's just so preferable to have local control as much as possible. Number two is data logging. And that's really something that most other smart home systems completely ignore. They may have a listing of events and timestamps of when they happened, but they have no ability to do things like graph temperatures over time. And that's something that I really like having. So Home Assistant all the way for data logging. Number three is user interface. Apps are great. They're great for using when you're away from home, when you need to do quick things but in some cases they are not a substitute for a big screen on a computer or a laptop. And Home Assistant does both really well. A lot of the other systems are app only, or if they do work with a computer, their interface is much more limited. Home Assistant is super customizable. You can do switches and graphs and gauges and plots, and it's just really great for my needs. Number four is community. 
Home Assistant is built by an open source project by community members. That means there's no company behind it backing it. That has its pros and cons, like there's no 1-800 number that you can call and get help. There's no support line. So you have to rely on forums and Google searches. But for the most part, it's really unlikely that you're having a problem that someone else hasn't already solved. So you just have to learn how to search Google for home assistant, whatever, and you can probably find the answer out there. Number five is integrations. That giant community is full of people with devices from all different manufacturers that want to get them connected to home assistant. Since it's open source, there are ways to do it. I mean, there are very few things that I have come across that there's not some way to connect to Home Assistant. When I first started using Home Assistant about a year ago, even then it was much more complicated to set up and use. So the developers have made huge strides even in that short amount of time, and I'm sure it's going to get even better in the future. Of course, there are other systems like Google Home or Apple's HomeKit that are much simpler to set up and use, but of course they're much more limited and a lot of their sensors cost a lot more money. Then you have devices like SmartThings or Hubitat that are kind of in between. They have more capability, but they don't have all of the capability of Home Assistant. For me, Home Assistant is really that one thing that can do almost anything I can imagine. And it has really been a great smart home system for my needs. So I hope you found this helpful. Let me know in the comments what you liked about it, if there are any things that you would like to see more details of. I plan to do more videos in the future, especially on some of my custom ESP home devices. My little air quality sensors, I haven't really found much about things like that on the internet. And then I have some really cool solar battery powered string lights in my backyard that I integrated in with Home Assistant. And I've not seen where anybody did anything really like that. So check those out in the future. Thanks for watching.